Right, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to those of you who are here. A warm welcome to anybody who may be listening beyond these four walls in the comfort of their own home or wherever, either now or at a later date, which is all now possible. Um, I'll get the parish notices out of the way first, and then we'll move on to the, the main meat of this evening, which is our talk. Um, first of all, apologies for anybody who has a wasted journey last time. Uh, as many of you will know, and if all of you are about to be told, um, sadly our speaker did not turn up last, uh, uh, the end of last uh, January. Um, uh, Christian Walmar seems to have had a, a diary malfunction, um, even though we had sent him a reminder uh, a couple of weeks before the meeting. Um, I have to say he is exceedingly contrite and apologetic. Um, so we have forgiven him and we've asked him to come back, but it will be next year because our programme for this year uh, is full. So uh, we, we will hear from Christian Warmer, uh, but probably not until uh, January, I think, of, uh, of next year. But uh, he did ask particularly for his apologies to be passed on to, uh, to anybody who either had a totally wasted journey uh, or a partially wasted journey. We've managed to get a notice out on email and Twitter at the relatively late uh, uh, knockings, uh, but uh, some people I think will sort of turn around at Victoria or elsewhere if, if not actually here. So apologies for that. Um, looking ahead to our meetings diary, uh, the next meeting is actually one of our Acton meetings uh, and John Parkin, who spoke quite recently sharing his extensive archive of his own photographs last time of the underground uh, will be presenting some bus related pictures uh, all around the turn of the transition from uh, London Transport to London Country uh, in the 1970s. Uh, John's underground presentation was very well received from those that were here. Uh, so that's on Thursday the 21st of March. Earlier today we did have some spaces available. If those of you who wanted to book have already spoken to Susan, you'll know now whether there are places still available. We were just nudging the 50 limit, uh, which I guess we've probably now reached. Uh, but if you're still interested and haven't spoken to Susan, uh, have a word with her uh, after this evening's meeting and she may possibly squeeze you in. Um, we meet here again uh, a few days after that on Monday the 25th of March. Uh, when our speaker will be Roger French, who's with us in the audience uh, this evening. Uh, Roger will give his presentation on uh, Britain's best bus routes, uh, obviously a personal matter of judgment, so it is a personal selection uh, of those routes that uh, Roger deems to, uh, to come within the definition of Britain's best. Uh, I've heard a, an early version of that presentation uh, in another place, uh, an excellent presentation it is, so we look forward to Roger on the 25th of March. Um, we've had quite an active weekend. The 38 tube stock train was out over the weekend, running around the circle and out to Amersham, uh, and we sent the TF Green Line coach to uh, the Epping Onga event at North Weald. Um, if anybody has... Uh, I was a car steward on the 38 tube stock train, which means I wasn't able to take any photos of the train going around the circle, because I was on it. Um, if anybody did take some photos uh, and would be happy to share those with me for possible publication in the magazine. That would be appreciated. Um, I learnt on Sunday that at relatively short notice, the museum is planning another outing of the 38 tube stock train, possibly to Upminster, not yet confirmed, uh, on Sunday the 17th of March. Again, also not confirmed as date, but that's the aspiration. If that happens, it will obviously happen very quickly, and provided we get confirmation in time, uh, we will share that with you in an email. Uh, but that's the, that's the current plan as I understand it. Um, I also understand that the next tranche of Hidden London tours will go on sale on Wednesday of next week, uh, and again, we will aim to get uh, notification of that out with the special link that friends have uh, to make prior bookings. Uh, so that's Wednesday of next week uh, for the next two or three months of, um, of Hidden London tour bookings. 
that's all I need to say, I think, other than to make the point, if you have got a mobile phone, please make certain it's switched off. Uh, and if there is a fire alarm, it will be a real one, and you evacuate from here either the way you came in, through the top of the stairs, or through the door uh, behind me here. And so it's a pleasure to welcome John Self, a uh, particular pleasure because A, it is a very timely subject, uh, because as his own title slide there tells you, uh, if you didn't know already, uh, it is 50 years and a little bit um, since the Victoria Line opened. Uh, a pleasure because John is a friend and is a member of uh, the Friends Management team, uh, and he is, again, as his own slide tells you, uh, well qualified to give the talk, because although he wasn't uh, the general manager or their predecessors when the Victoria Line opened, uh, he was, I think, the first person to have the title Victoria Line General Manager uh, on the dates that are on the screen. So who better to talk to us about the Victoria Line than John Self? <clears throat> oh, thank you very much, Barry. And can everybody hear me at the back? just to check the microphone's working and all that. Uh, slightly daunting, because I see one or two faces in the audience, including a former boss. Um, so he'll no doubt speak to me afterwards and tell me the bits I got wrong. But uh, anyway, 50 years. It's frightening, isn't it? I didn't think it was that long. Um, just over 50 years since the first bit opened. Um, just under 50 years before the official royal opening of the line down to Victoria. Uh, the people on the right are just there because that happened to be on the title slide and I couldn't get rid of it um, <laughs> because I'm not that technically competent. But, um, but it is actually a lot about people anyway. Uh, so that's the uh, front of the little leaflet. Lots of little leaflets and booklets were produced about the Victoria Line because it was quite a momentous thing when it opened. It had lots of firsts, which I'll come on to later. And that was one of the many leaflets produced by London Transport. Uh, when the line started. You'll see in the bottom right-hand corner the little uh, logo that was used extensively, which you'll see several times. So these are the sorts of areas I'm going to cover. It's 50 years in about 50 minutes, which is a bit of a challenge. So I may overrun. Uh, I may get so quick that I underrun, but who knows. Uh, but what I wanted to cover was my personal involvement with the Victoria Line, what is the Victoria Line? A bit about the planning of the line and the building of the line. Some stories from testing and commissioning. Uh, opening the line for passenger service. The early years, the midlife crisis, which may have been my midlife crisis, or it's um, or, or problem years of the Victoria Line. Uh, and then into the 21st century. My, my involvement started, I started work with London Transport in 1966 as a student trainee in the Chief Mechanical Engineer Railways Department. We had very grand titles then. Um, over the next 20 years, I held a variety of posts in uh, the CME Railways Department and ultimately became Rolling Stock Design Engineer. Um, so clearly through that period, the Victoria Line featured quite a lot in my working life. Uh, then in early 1988, I became Engineering Manager Operations, and in November of that year, General Manager of the Victoria Line. One of my favourite jobs, I have to say. Uh, and then from 1996 until I left LT in May 2000, I was Line General Manager on the Jubilee in East London. You probably don't need to be reminded of the tube map, but the Victoria Line is the light blue one. Um, oh. <laughs> I didn't mean to do I thought that was going to be a little uh, red dot, but anyway, don't worry. Um, the light blue one, which actually on the map looks rather larger than it actually is in practice. It probably looks as long there as the central line and the district line, and of course it's not. It's actually 13.28 miles, or for those younger people, 21 and a quarter kilometres between Walthamstow and Brixton. There's a branch from Seven Sisters to Northumberland Park, which is 1.45 miles. Um, and there's a staff train that has operated since the line opened and still does open, uh, operate uh, because it's a bit of a long walk for people, um, train crew particularly, to get up to the depot plus the maintenance staff. Um, there are 16 stations in all, 33 platforms. Seven Sisters has three platforms. Uh, and the whole line uniquely is underground except for the depot. 
generally the diameter of the running tunnels is 12 feet and it's at an average depth of 70 feet. I'll let you do the maths about how many metres that is. Um, and all of the stations on the line are interchange stations with the exception of Pimlico. There are tile motifs unique to each station. I'm sure you've noticed them. Uh, I won't go through what they all are now, but if we have time at the end, maybe we'll have a quiz. Um, and at the moment, the line is operating 36 trains an hour in the peak, which is quite a, a sizable uh, fleet of trains. So there are actually more trains in service than there are platforms. So if something goes wrong, and they try desperately not to, you're always going to get people stuck in the tunnel. Uh, currently, the service is operated by 09 stock. There are 47 trains of that, uh, and 43 of them are required for the peak service. The original line from Walthamstow to Victoria had, or well, 30 and a half trains were ordered. Uh, that's 30 and a half um, a four car unit, so it's 61 units, um, and then nine more were ordered for the Brixton extension. And then later on in life, because the line got so popular, four trains of 72 tube stops, which are very similar, were converted to run with the 67 tube stop. Um, in the mid 90s, there were 140 million customer journeys a year. It's considerably more now, it doesn't seem to stop. Uh, end to end, it takes about 30 minutes. It used to be in my day about 32 minutes, I think. Now it's a shade under 30 minutes. And for large periods of the day, a thing called stepping back is carried out at both Brixton and Walthamstow. Uh, this is to get the trains to turn around. The drivers can't walk fast enough from one end to the other. So what happens is you shut down your train walk to the end of the platform. Meantime, somebody else takes your train away and you, you take the next but one train. There's a tar motif. That's uh, Euston and it represents the Doric arch that used to be outside Euston and I understand may come back in some form as part of High Speed 2. Who knows? But you'll notice the architectural feature, I mean, all grey tiles on the Victoria Line, the only colour really was the tile motifs um, and really the passengers' clothing. It was the 1960s and I remember somebody from the architect saying it's the passengers that will bring the colour to this railway. <laughs> so let's look at the planning of the line. If you go back to the British Transport Commission produced a London Plan Working Party report in 1949 which had as Route C a line from the Tottenham and Edmonton area down to East Croydon. And the early th thoughts were that the tunnels for that line should be main line size tunnels. In the event, because of the difficulty in threading the line through and the costs and all the rest of it, it ended up being a tube line. Parliamentary powers were granted in 1955 but no money was attached to the, uh, the powers. So it's a bit unfortunate. The, the amount of money needed was something like £91 million. Pounds. Sounds very cheap compared to what modern railways are costing, but there we are. Um, finally, Harold Macmillan, who had become Prime Minister, signed the deal, said you can run the railway, and construction was from Waltham so central. It was originally going to be Wood Street, the line was originally going to come up to the surface at Walthamstow, run on to Wood Street, which is on the Chingford branch, and there would be stabling sidings um, there where the trains would reverse. Uh, in the end, because of cost, that was cut back to Walthamstow Central. Uh, it was approved on the 20th of August, and part of the justification for it was that there was increasing unemployment, and it was felt this was a good way to start using the skills of people uh, Three key alternative routes to the one that finally was chosen were considered. Between Green Park and Warren Street, one of the routes was via Bond Street and Regent's Park. The second one was between King's Cross and Finsbury Park going via the Nags Head. 
and the third one was between Finsbury Park and Seven Sisters going via Manor House. And if that had happened, it would have been a new alignment for the Piccadilly line going between Finsbury Park and Turnpike Lane for various reasons, mainly to do with cost, other services under the underground at those points, and the need to get cross-platform interchange. Those were dismissed and we ended up with the line that we now have. It was the first project, first railway project in this country at least, that benefited from social cost-benefit analysis. I'm not going to try and give you a lecture on cost, social cost-benefit analysis because at least one person in the room knows more about it than I do. Um, but it was produced by two eminent people, Michael Beasley of the LSE and Christopher Foster of Cambridge University. Um, and this, in simple terms, what it says is it will cost X pounds to build this railway and you'll get revenue of Y pounds over, over time. And that probably won't be anywhere near enough to justify building this. So social cost benefit analysis enables you to take account of other factors, such as relieving congestion on the roads, uh, congestion on other railway lines, uh, including British railways as well as the underground, uh, savings in passengers time, and so on. So at the end of the day, the important thing was it was enough to cause the government to be able to say, yes, we approve the building of this railway line. And it's still used to this day on other, other projects. The idea is it has to be more than one point something or other to be able to be built. So cross-platform interchange was uh, a requirement where it was possible and a hump profile wherever it was possible. And again, because of other railway lines, other services, it wasn't always possible. And sometimes the hump came in the wrong place. So if you go to Finsbury Park, uh, the hump is in the middle of the platform, uh, which is where you, you don't want it to be because it's always been a challenge to get the train to brake correctly. Uh, but the whole purpose of the hump pro profile, as you may well know, because it's used particularly on the central line and others, is you go up a fairly steep hill on the approach to a station, so gravity helps you to break, and when you leave the platform, you, you drop down and you get to energy helping you to move. South of Highbury, the tunnels roll over. So the southbound tunnel rolls over the northbound, and it does the opposite when it gets to Warren Street. This was dreamt up by a guy called Erwin Rockwell, who was in the LT planning department. And the whole reason for doing it was to make sure that when you got to Euston, you could have cross-platform interchange with the city branch of the Northern Line. And of course, at that point, they go, the two railways are going in the opposite direction. One of the requirements was that no curve should be sharper than 400 metres. If you look at the early tube lines, they all follow the streets. And that's mainly to avoid the builders having to pay uh, way leaves to the people who own the property above them. So by following the street, you didn't have to pay anybody. For the Victoria line, it was decided we don't want to be constrained by having sharp curves at various unfortunate places. It's expensive, it's annoying, it slows everything down. So we uh, Somebody bit the bullet, paid for the way leaves, and the line runs over lots of people's property, which in itself did cause us problems. It was also decided to use new technology. Uh, on the district line, some trials, early trials being carried out with automatic train operation, and then subsequently further trials carried out on the Haynort Woodford service. Um, the district line trials were in 1963 between Stanford Brook and Ravens Court Park using one R stock train and the central line was introduced in 1964 after the railway inspectorate had said yes it looks like this is a workable system you can try it further and the last uh, thing in the planning of it was that it was going to be the first line to be one person operated or one man operated as it was at the time um, it was made possible by ATO. All tube lines, or all 
lines up to that point it had a guard as well as a driver and it meant that if the driver became incapacitated then the guard could move forward and move the train to the next station. The railway inspectorate were very keen to say well you can't go deep level tube without a guard so the ATO system must make sure if the driver is incapacitated the train will drive itself to the next station where help can be given. One of the drivers of one person operation was of course that in the 1960s it was getting increasingly difficult to get people who were willing to come and work, shift work particularly on London transport and various other uh, particularly nationalised industries. So we then move on to building the line. There was an experimental tunnel, and I guess it's still there, between Finsbury Park and Manor House where various things were tried, different uh, mechanical uh, devices to help in the building. They used both concrete and cast iron tunnel segments, depends on the ground conditions, which one you chose. The concrete linings have the advantage, it's much smoother, therefore there's less drag on the train going through. Um, so that's used in the majority of places. Construction actually started in 1963 and tunnelling was completed to Victoria by September 1966. In part of the construction or the building, other services were diverted and I can show you some pictures shortly. So the northern line had to be diverted to, to give you the cross-platform interchange. So if you look now, what was the island platform on the bank branch? now has a large single platform because you have the northern line one side uh, construction was done to give the uh, the new victoria line the other side um, and the northern city lines at drayton park and finsley park were also diverted they used tunneling shields rather than the very sophisticated tunnel boring machines of today so whereas at the moment if you go down to a crossrail site Thames, uh, Thames Waters, uh, big sewer, very sophisticated machines do all the work, computer control with very little manual intervention. Not the same on the Victoria line, it was still a lot of manual labour. There was also the problem south of the river and under the Lee Valley in particular where the ground conditions were quite poor and various techniques had to be used to freeze the ground so you could tunnel through it. So it's either chemical freezing or whatever. And then Oxford Circus was a challenge because you wanted to build a new ticket hall right in the middle of a very busy road interchange. So they came up with the idea of an umbrella, again, which I can show you pictures of. In order to do the fitting out of the Victoria Line, uh, new battery locos were built by Metro Camel, built in 1964 numbered L20 to L32 and numbers 25 to 32 for those that are interested in numbers uh, had cab signalling fitted so that they could operate on the Victoria line once the signalling system was in place uh, and the other impact of the Victoria line was that the Northern City line no longer ran right up to from Allgate up to Finsbury Park but was cut back to Drayton Park so there's a picture of the step plate junction at Highbury and you can see a northern city line train going through it. That's the umbrella being created at Oxford Circus over one weekend. I don't think you get away with it now. There are members of the public standing there looking <laughs> with large lumps of metal floating over their heads. You notice the hard hatted uh, flat caps. Um, wouldn't be surprised if someone weren't wearing, oh they didn't have trainers then did they? Slippers or something but anyway. And there's a, a picture I'd forgotten actually that when this was in place um, the road system around Oxford Circus became one way because obviously you'd lost some of the width of the road. So that was all created over the weekend so that the ticket all could be created underneath it and subsequently when that was complete over a weekend the whole lot was taken away again and the roads restored. 
That's an image of one of the tunnelling machines, a very crude device compared to the ones I've subsubsequently seen on Crossrail and uh, Northern Line Extension. But you can see the cutting head, and that's obviously just come out of a, uh, a running tunnel into a station tunnel, where it's uh, a much bigger diameter tunnel, of course. Again, notice the uh, health and safety. Um, <laughs> The flat cap, typical flat cap, and the, um, oh, I guess he's got high visibility uh, <laughs> cream on or something, I don't know. Uh, but that's the machine putting the concrete tunnel linings in that particular case. And you can see part of the hydraulic rams that push against the uh, cutting head to create the space to uh, use the rams to put the uh, lining in place. It's another image. A lot of manual labour. You see there people with uh, shovels. Uh, I think they did use power tools as well. But it really was, when you think about 50 years hence, the world has moved on a tremendous amount in, in this area. That's one of the battery locos. Uh, if you look very carefully, and I'm not going to press the get the red button because I might lose the whole lot. Um, but in front of the leading wheel, if you can see, there's a lump there, which is actually the pickup coil. So it does the uh, pick up, picks up the codes um, to give them the cab signalling, give the driver the cab signalling. So let's move on to testing commissioning. Um, I mentioned the district line before. There were trials of ticket gates and magnetic tickets, I think at Chiswick Park. Uh, and on the, there was an R-stock trial of the ATO system from between Stamford Brook and Ravenscourt Park on the eastbound. Um, these were enough to test the system, and of course the reason they were held on the district line in that area was because the Chief Accounting Engineers Department's based at Acton, and the Chief Signal Engineer was, at, uh, was also at Acton, so it made it very convenient to, to get to the test beds. Um, some, uh, before the RSOP went on the Stanford Brook Ravenscourt Park, I think they did some trials also on the South, uh, South Ealing uh, to Acton Town uh, four track section, which is used as a, or the, the two inner roads are used as test track to this day, I think. Once it got proven there, it moved over to the Haydort Woodford test bed, and at least one member of the audience here, uh, probably the first time I ever met him was when he was. Uh, much more senior than me. He was an executive assistant. I was still a trainee. But uh, um, that's where the bulk of the work was done. And the, there were about four trains, four or five trains of 1960 tube stock were equipped with ATO equipment. And on one of them, uh, all the wiring was brought up into a, um, an equipment room behind the driver's cab. So a bit like standard stock, the bit from the driver's cab to the front pair of double doors was full of equipment, which meant, depending on how the testing was going, you'd come and do modifications very easily. And then once you'd proved what you were doing, you could then get the depot to do the modifications on the rest of them. The ATO system, I think the person who probably is credited with coming up with the concept was Robert Dell, who was the chief single engineer. Allegedly, he, he was a keen fisherman and went fishing in Scotland. And while he was there, he was either having a bad day catching fish or something, I don't know. But anyway, apparently that's when he came up with the concept and no doubt rushed back south and um, got his team working on it. So it was Robert Tell's signal department colleagues who looked at some of the systems, the safety side of it. And Albert Mansa, who was the chief mechanical engineer railways, did all the, or led the team looking at all the rolling stock aspects of it. So that there are two distinct bits, and I'm not going to give you a talk about the, um, how, the, how the system works in any detail. Uh, if you really want to do that, then I recommend a visit to Acton uh, Museum <laughs> Depot at Acton, where there is a demonstration rig uh, based on a 6-7 tube stock and all the equipment, and that will explain it far better than I can do that do in this room tonight. But broadly, there are two, two systems. There are coils on the front of the train, or each end of the train, four coils. Two of them uh, are uh, safety coils. They feed the safety circuits and go into the safety box on the train, 
which was a signal department piece of equipment. And basically you were picking up codes, or the train should be picking up codes. If it didn't pick up codes, it stopped. And depending on the codes it picked up, either the train could run at full speed, or it could run at a reduced speed, or it would come to a stop and then restart after a signal uh, stop. The auto driver box did the non-safety bits that made the train start and stop, uh, adjusted the braking and it picked up the command spots at various places, uh, picked up by the coils at the front of the train and depending on what you were picking up you would adjust your braking so when you were coming to a station you would receive a frequency in effect, so many pulses a minute, a second and then you would, depending on the what that was, the train would adjust its speed to suit. And you would gradually come to a stop in the right place, hopefully. Uh, the South Ealing test track, a lot of the braking tests were done. Um, but most of it was done at Hainault. So what happened, once trains were delivered, the trains were built by Metro Camel in Birmingham. And they were delivered by rail to Ryslip, where they were commissioned. So they had to be lifted, the traction motors were fitted, the shoe gear was fitted, various other things. Then they used to go on a test run down to North Acton, come back to Ryslip. No doubt things were found, so they had to be fixed. And then when they, when they were ready to go, they were then sent down to Hainault, and then they ran up and down on the Hainault Woodford service for a period to bed down. And this actually continued for some years. So getting the trains to Northumberland Park, well, to start with, the only way to get to Northumberland Park was to leave Hainault, go to Leighton. Then there was a link at Leighton, which the British Railways service used first thing in the morning to get to Epping and Onga. Uh, so you go through uh, Temple Mills, and then you pick up the Lee Valley line, go up the Lee Valley line to Northumberland Park, and then there was a link, a temporary link put in between that, the Lee Valley line and Northumberland Park Depot. <coughs> Once construction of the line had moved forward, uh, there was then a link at Finsbury Park. So trains could uh, use to fit trip cocks to them. They would run along to back to, down to the west, to Ealing, go over onto the Piccadilly line, back to Finsbury Park, across onto the Victoria line and up to the depot. So it's quite a long route but at least it got them there. That's a picture of a 1960 tube stop where the uh, early tests were done. You can tell it's um, one of the modified ones because there are no side cab doors. They were sealed up because there was concern that the driver might get out just at the wrong time. The train was <laughs> go off on its own. Uh, similarly, the tripcot rope or tripcot reset rope you can see hanging up halfway up the door so that if, if the driver had gone past the signal and been tripped, he could reset it without getting out of the cab. And if you, if you look to the left of the word Woodford, you may just about make out a radio aerial. So that was one of the trains that was uh, used on the Hayden at Woodford. If you go down to the depot, there are some smiling faces. They won't necessarily all be there. But the, these are the guys, Ian Arthurton to the left on the right, uh, on the, uh, with the red shirt. He's the boss. Uh, Frank uh, Messenger, Ted Robinson and Brian Morgan are the other three. And they've been spending many happy hours building a rig. And you can go and see it any time there's a depot open day. And you'll see... In the distance is a cut off, cut, cutaway version of a 67 tube stock cab. The scrap dealers were persuaded to leave one behind when they took the cars away. And that's been made good use of. Uh, while all the engineering people were doing their thing, of course, they had to be recruitment and training of staff. And the line actually became the senior line. Um, because it was one person operated or one man operated, um, because seniority was the way forward um, to get anywhere at that time. Um, it was open to those who had the most years seniority on other parts of the network. 
So, and because they were going to be one person operated, the deal was they got paid more money. So it was a popular line. Lots of people applied, not everybody got there, but they were seen as the senior drivers. They were, they were called ATOs, Automatic Train Operators. Um, and they had to do all their training and recruitment, both at White City in the training centre and out on the line. Other problems we had were drying out the tunnels. One of the jobs as a trainee, as I then was, was to ride on trains uh, on the first section of line up from uh, Seven Sisters up towards Walthamstow and you would guarantee you would be spuriously tripped all over because there was so much water around it was affecting the signalling system. So the trains would trip. Once you tripped and the train stopped, you lowered the drop light window and used your spray of what might paint so that later on people could go back and work out where the problem was. Eventually, the civil engineers had to provide huge fans uh, and blowers to try and get the tunnel dried, which they sort of did eventually. The lunchtime project meetings were interesting. Uh, the, the person from Acton who um, was in charge of the development team, uh, was a guy called Bill Maxwell, who subsequently went on to be... Um, Chief Operating Manager Railways and then Engineering Director for um, London Transport. Um, he used to chair a project meeting every lunchtime uh, in the nearest place to Highbury and Islington Station that could accommodate us, which happened to be a pub <laughs> called The Cock, which may still be there for all I know. Um, and he used to sit at the end of the table Sounds terrible now with, as things have gone on with uh, drugs and alcohol policies. But anyway, he would sit at the end of the table. Uh, we'd all have our lunch. He'd have his bottle of red wine. Um, and on one side of the table would be the rolling stock people and on the other side of the table would be uh, the signal engineers people. And we would discuss what had happened in the morning and if there was any accusation, it was the signal lot's fault then you were very soon put in your place because I think he, I think Bill Maxwell's skill was he used to each lunchtime make sure each side of the table took half the problems. Uh, so nobody was, nobody was terribly uh, hurt by it. But after a very nice lunch, we would then be sent back onto the line to do another five or six hours of train testing. But it seemed to work. Next one I remember is the Seven Sisters gauging problem, as I euphemistically called it. In the middle platform at Seven Sisters is a footbridge uh, that takes you across from one side to the other. And it has a false bottom, which was covered with uh, melamine sheeting for mica or something, I don't know. Um, anyway, the thing with gauging, uh, the, the gauge train that we used was quite a crude device. It was a uh, an old wagon and it had three templates, one at each end and one in the middle. And we used to go out routinely going around the whole network actually doing gauging to make sure things hadn't been put in the space that it shouldn't have been put. Uh, and generally you didn't have too much problems. What you used to do is put metal fingers out when you were ready to go down the next bit of line to be checked. And if, and if it scraped on something, you, if it was your um, there were six of you sitting around the train, so if you're, you heard the, a finger by where you were sitting scrape, you pulled the emergency brake handle on the train stop and you went back to see what it was you'd scraped on. You didn't normally find very much, but of course with a brand new line, things are a bit different. So I remember we're going out on the gauging train from Northumberland Park, and we went down and we went into the middle bay and immediately destroyed the gauge car, uh, because the false bottom was too far down. So we actually hit it and it knocked all the templates over. So that was interesting. <laughs> On stage two, and it was a few nights before it was due to open to the public, I was on a test train 
I can't remember what we were testing, but anyway, we were on it. And as we were approaching King's Cross on the way north, there was an almighty bang, and the train came to a halt halfway along the platform with air pouring out of the uh, train line. So we got down to have a look, and fortunately, because the platform is a suicide pit, so we were able to get down underneath the train and have a look. And we saw the shoe beam that was sort of broken in half. So we were very lucky we hadn't derailed ourselves. So we thought we'd better walk down the tunnel and find out what it is that had caused this. And we got to the first cross passage. Um, or just before the cross passage. In fact, we found an oil drum, an empty oil drum, which is what we'd clearly hit. Um, and that caused the problem. When we went into the cross passage, uh, there were the playing cards that <laughs> had obviously been on this empty oil drum. Uh, I don't know who's playing cards in the cross passage. I suspect P Way people. Um, and as we came along, of course, the draft of the train dragged the empty oil can out, uh, and we hit it. That I believe is the first time the breakdown gang ever visited the Victoria Line. And I remember having to meet them on the street level at King's Cross because they couldn't quite find their way down to the platform. The last thing I remember was being in the cab of the first 67 tube stop that actually went into Victoria Station. So that's one of those things you'll already remember. Went in very slowly, but we got there. That's the supplement to the Traffic Circular Railways, the Victoria Line, published in September uh, 1968, uh, that was issued to all the staff that need to know, and it was the operation of 1967 tube stop trains. I still have my copy, as I also have a copy of the supplement number 27, which is all about the opening of stage one of the Victoria line between Walthamstow and Highbury. So they're very good documents to have. So if anyone wants to borrow it, let me know. Small fee. Um, anyway, let's see some pictures. Um, many of the pictures, and thank you to Carolyn Warhurst for many of these from the museum collection, uh, are in black and white. Um, so the grey tiles look even greyer. Um, but the colour there, Green Park, I think the tile motif there is you are a bird or something looking down on the park and you're seeing the tops of the trees. Okay, but a bit of colour, nice wooden seats, nicely polished, some illuminated adverts, not a lot in the, it's all very simple actually, very few signs pointing the way, in this case the Piccadilly line and way out, and probably behind it a train describer. Um, so I think, you know, design wise, there was a guy called uh, Maisha Black who headed the uh, design panel, so he influenced both the design of the rolling stock and the stations. <laughs> Over the years, we've managed to add lots of things and make it very difficult to see. There's a picture of a 6-7 tube sock out in the open air, probably over at Ricep or uh, um, Hainault. That's the publicity shot that was taken. And again, you can just about make out the um, coil on the front of the train, uh, in front of the wheels. To the right of the um, destination indicator, by the way, is a thing called the calling on light, which I'll come on to later on. There's an interior view of the, it's a trailer car, you can tell it's a trailer car because it's got all longitudinal seats. Uh, features to note, it's sort of double glazed, i.e. the door pockets extend right down. Uh, you've got illuminated adverts for the first time there. You can see it's got a central line route map in, so you can tell it's going to go into service on the Hayden at Woodford. Uh, and the doors, um, it's the first time that the glass in the doors extended right up near to the top of the door, so that when you were standing by the door, you didn't have to stoop to, to see where you were. As far as I know, the, the, that was trialled on a Northern Line car. I seem to think it was... What, 10, 306, but I can't remember. Somebody will put me right on that. That's a view of the cab of a train. Again, quite, quite
quite simple. Um, you've got the controller handle, so you can... Let's try... Oh, no, I've done it again. Oh, I'm not going to risk it. Um, controller handle at, uh, to the left-hand side, which the driver can use when he's in uh, coded manual or slow manual. If he's in slow manual, he also has to have his hand on the button that's sticking up uh, close to the right-hand side of the desk. Hold it down. That's the equivalent of a dead man's handle. Um, you've got start buttons, one each side of the, um, the button I've just talked about. And the other thing sticking up is where the driver's reverser key goes and selects forward or reverse. Um, I mean, where, in normal operation, the driver didn't have to do anything other than start the train by pressing the two buttons. And if everything worked properly, the train then went on its own to the next station. Yeah. Uh, if it had to stop at a signal in between times, once the signal cleared, the train started off on its own. Once he got to the next station, he would have to pull down the drop light window, put his head out. Once he was satisfied, the platform was still there. He would then use the device on the back wall of the cab, which was a rotary device that you could uh, move to open the doors, pushing it one way, close the doors the other. The wheel closest to me on the left controlled the hydraulic handbrake. Because it was one person operated, you had to be sure that you could hold a crush-loaded train on the steepest gradient, which is, happens to be one in 30. And the only way to do that, on previous stock, you wound a handle uh, that pulled rods and cables and so on in order to get the number of uh, um, brake cylinders on on these trains. You had a hydraulic handbrake. And they were a source of problem ever since. But there we go, that was there. And the bit of equipment that's missing is above the drop light window, you can see four holes, and that's where a thing called the identra was fitted. Uh, and what the identra was, you turned, the driver would turn a, a, um, a handle on there, and it would set the destination of the train, which was then transmitted to coils on the tunnel and set all the train describers ahead. When the driver was doing his station duties, he had closed circuit television, so he could see from the other end of the train, uh, make sure all was well. You see the illuminated roundel, which was a feature of stations on the Victoria Line, and below that the litter bin, which of course subsequently were removed. <coughs> There's a picture of Oxford Circus, and they are the original uh, gates that were used, much chunkier than the uh, gates in use today. That's, um, that's what they were and you had a, a magnetic card that you put in there, a yellow card, a brown <coughs> magnetic coating on the back. There was one trial done I think at Seven Sisters, <coughs> the trial where the gates were permanently open and only if you put in a dodgy ticket or attempted to go through with no ticket at all did the gate close in front of you but it didn't last very long. <coughs> That's a picture of Coburg Street. Again, must be early days because hardly anybody there and it all looks very tidy. Um, you can see a diagram there, so the regulator who's sitting down below, the one with the bald head, he, he, he can see what's going on there. He can talk to the drivers, they can talk to him. And sitting on the desk high above him is the line controller who talks to the regulator and talks to the headquarters controller. And to the left, you can see a little bit of what is the power, um, traction power indicators. And again, you can see closed circuit television. So, I mean, the Victoria Line started to get lots of things that subsequently became quite um, quite normal. Seven Sisters, if you look to the left, you can see the motif. It's seven trees. The trees were apparently known as the Seven Sisters. 
That's a picture of the depot. We've moved on a few years. The clue is in the fact that it's a 90, uh, sorry, an 09 stock in the, uh, in the far distance rather than a 67 tube stock. But that's the, really the only open bit of track that's coming out of the tunnel up the slope into uh, Northumberland Park Depot. And the next picture, which I shows my poor skills at um, presentation writing because I've chopped off the actual control tower. Um, but the brick bit is the bottom of it. Okay, but the control tower is used to control all movements within the depot. So again, you had one person in the control tower, they could see what was going on in the depot, they could talk to the driver, and they, they operated the points and controlled train movement. So, opening the line to passenger service, sorry about the R's got uh, moved. Um, it opened in stages, the first stage, Waltham Soda Highbury on the 1st of September 1968. Highbury and Islington to Warren Street on the 1st of December 1968, to Victoria on the 7th of March 69, got down to Brixton on the 23rd of July 1971. At that point, the single fare, end to end actually, Warren Street to, uh, sorry, Waltham so to Brixton was 25 pence. It was five pence between stations. Uh, Pimlico Station was late opening because it was late. It was late approved as well in 1972, and I actually got invited to the royal opening of the Bricks Extension. Well, actually, the rehearsal. Uh, that's the that's the Queen, of course, in the middle. Uh, to to the left of her is the uh, public relations officer of the day, or chief public relations officer, Mr. Wilkins. Sticking his head out of the cab door is the then operating manager, chief operating manager, who was uh, F.G. Maxwell. And to the right of the Queen is Anthony Bull, who was vice chairman of LT. And to his right is the then Minister of Transport, which is Richard Marsh. OK. And I don't know whether they were trying to persuade the Queen to put in for a job of guard, but anyway, <laughs> the... Uh, the wage rates were published there. And there's a picture of the front of the train with the appropriate roundel and uh, V behind it, <coughs> with the Queen doing the driving, presumably at that point. It's just leaving Green Park to head down, uh, head to Oxford Circuit, it says on the front. And there's my invitation to the Royal Opening rehearsal. It's an interesting thing. I played the part of the Chief Mechanical Engineer. Um, Princess Alexandra was played by Christine of the Public Relations Office. <laughs> and, we, and we did the full thing. We, we, we did everything as we had to do. The police were there and everybody, the searches were done, everything. We even did the trip from the station by bus to Lambeth Town Hall for the reception. The only difference was on the rehearsal, the bus left Brixton, went round the one-way system, stopped outside the town hall momentarily, and went back to the station, dropped us all off, and we went back in the station for a sandwich and a cup of tea. I'm told on the real uh, event, they got rather more uh, food in Lambeth Town Hall. Um, anyway, Victoria Line first, I mentioned quite a lot of these. Uh, it was the first railway in the UK justified using social cost-benefit analysis. Uh, the other project going on at the same sort of time was the M1 motorway, which also was justified under the same analysis. It was the first underground line to go one person operated. Uh, the first female train operator on the Victoria line didn't join until 1991. Uh, it was the first passenger train in the world to be automatically driven, uh, fairly closely followed by the initial line in Hong Kong, the Hong Kong MTR, which was really Victoria Line Mark II. Quite a few people from London went out to Hong Kong. It was the London Underground rule book. It was the London Underground everything, really. Um, it's changed a bit now, but it, it, uh, it got it off to a good start. It was the first line to use automatic ticket gates, controlling entry and exit. Um, it was the first real line to, to make extensive use of CCTV and the first line to have a driver line control room communication system. It could be used on the move. 
It was also the first to have signal department equipment on board the train, which was, I'm not sure whether the signal department were comfortable with it. They certainly were always very worried that depot staff might interfere with their box, so we were under strict instructions not to touch it at all. Um, whereas auto driver boxes were known to be moved from one end of a train to another in service when uh, trains didn't start when they should have done. Um, the first trains to have illuminated adverts. I, I hesitate with the next one. The first trains to have longitudinal, all longitudinal seating in some cars. I suspect somebody will tell me the padded cell was all longitudinal seating or something. But um, first trains, and probably the only ones actually, to have two level armrests. This, the idea was that it meant you could sit comfortably with your neighbour without arguing about whose elbow went where. Um, it was the first new underground line. Again, for 30 years, if you say extensions to some of the existing lines was the last bit of building, if you really want to go to the last complete line, then the Victoria Line was the first line for something like 60 years. And the first line, uh, first train to have extended window glass in the doors. So in the early years, what were you doing? Well, you had to get the grips with electronics. I mean... It's frightening to think about how my grandchildren and others play with phones and the electronics equipment these days. But the electronics used on the Victoria Line really was leading edge and were very... Um, it, was a, it was new. I mean, yeah, we had to set up a, an electronics shop at Northumberland Park, electronics workshop at Acton. You know, these were, this was a whole new field for people. Hydraulic handbrakes were needed, as I said earlier, to cope with OPO, but they were a real pain. They were forever leaking. It's very difficult to keep them leak-free. That became a fire hazard, of course, and ultimately they were taken off and replaced with spring-applied parking brakes. The carrier wave system that was used for the direct uh, controller to uh, drive a communication on the move was great, but was a bit variable. And if somebody had put a short circuit device down because there had been a problem, then you couldn't use it anyway. So it, it, it was a step in the right direction, um, but really only lasted until radio uh, technology improved uh, and that, that it was replaced. Uh, the calling on lights were used so that um, if, a dry, if a train was in trouble and needed to be pushed out by the train behind, the driver could set it all up without leaving his cab. So he would switch on the calling on light so the driver of the train behind knew when he was told to draw up to it, he was drawing up to the right train. Uh, and when he did that, he could also talk. Uh, there was a radio link between the two trains was set up. Uh, so they could talk about the final coupling up part of the procedure. Train overhaul was transferred to Northumberland Park Depot uh, and the first unit was completed in July 1986. Um, the battery locos that had ATO equipment on didn't last, or cab signal at least, didn't last for too many years. There were problems with some of the kit. Uh, mechanical governors actually cracked and fell off um, and it was decided not to um, try and keep them working. So, in fact, every time you needed an engineer's train on the Victoria line, you had to take a full line possession, which in the early days wasn't too much of a problem. Uh, but as the line got older uh, and you needed more engineer's trains, it became a bit of a problem. I mentioned already the conversion of 472 tube stops to increase the fleet. The Victoria L67 tube stop continued to operate the Hainer Woodford service right up to 84. Uh, UTS trials were carried out at Vauxhall from October 82 to July 83, and then a thing called the UTS uh, project was set up um, uh, and expanded in what is now the ticketing system. There was a major fire at Oxford Circus Station in November 1984. Uh, we had a couple of incidents of unintended driverless trains. <laughs> Uh, one was Pimlico to Victoria, uh, Victoria to Pimlico. Um, I think what happened was the uh, the driver got the door shut and pressed the two start buttons, but at the same time 
some school kids who were probably uh, inquisitive as to what would happen pulled one of the door leaves back on the spring arm, put their foot in it, so it stopped the train leaving. Now the driver, I guess with the best intentions, decided he would get out of the front door of his train, on to step across the cup onto the platform and walk back to investigate. As soon as the kids saw him, of course, they pulled their foot out of the door. Uh, the door shut, uh, completed the circuit again and off went the train, <laughs> leaving the driver somewhat embarrassed. Um, the train got to Pimlico with no problem. Fortunately, the station inspector on duty was the next train operator. So he realised when he had been sitting there a little while and he investigated, um, he looked in the cab and there was no driver. So uh, he at least got in there and let the passengers out and wanted to get out. Uh, meantime, the driver had got a taxi from uh, Victoria to Pimlico and rejoined his train. Um, I don't believe he was reimbursed for the taxi. Uh, in fact, I'm not even sure he carried on being a train driver for much longer, but anyway. Um, the other time, to my knowledge, was a train between Finsbury Park and Seven Sisters. Um, at Finsbury Park, going northbound, a driver had seen a notice on the head wall that said there was a problem with the radio. Um, so that if they needed to talk to the control room, then they would have to use the uh, signal post telephones. <clears throat> anyway, he got, got going towards Seven Sisters. And he came to a halt signal stop. So nothing unusual with that, but the signal stop was a bit longer than he thought it should be. Now what he should have done, and could have done, was to drive the train forward manually until he got to the headway post where the signal was, uh, where the telephone was. And the telephone would have been at the right height for him to pull the drop light window down, pick it up and talk to the control room. But he didn't. He got out of the front of the train, walked along the track, then realised he couldn't now reach the <laughs> telephone. Um, but at that moment, the signal cleared and the train started to move. I don't suppose he could ever do it again, but he, he managed to jump up onto the noise reduction uh, platform which isn't very big, fortunately he took his weight and he had to sit there while his train passed him <laughs> and went off to Seven Sisters. Now he was due to be relieved at Seven Sisters anyway, <laughs> so there was a driver waiting to take his train on. Uh, well he wasn't actually waiting by the cab, he, he left it quite late to come out of the mess room. So by the time he came onto the platform he assumed that the driver had left the cab because there was nobody in it. So he got on quite unperturbed, um, did what he had to do and left for Walthamstow. Meanwhile, our driver is now still halfway between Finsbury Park and Seven Sisters in the tunnel. So the next thing that happens, of course, is the next train comes along. So he now finds himself furiously waving and hoping that the driver of the train is actually looking out at the front. Because the disadvantage with automatic trains is you don't actually need to be looking out the front to drive. Because fortunately, in this case, his colleague was looking, wondered what on earth was happening, and managed to put the brakes on and stop the train in time, or almost in time, just past him. So the people in the leading car, passengers in the leading car, <laughs> all they could see was this sort of jelly like figure who was then ushered into the cab um, and eventually taken off to Seven Sisters. Again, I know for sure he didn't drive a train again. I don't think he actually wanted to. <laughs> we had real problems with wheel and rail issues. Um, I won't bore you with what the causes were, they were numerous. Um, but it really all started, I think, because we had lubricators uh, which had to be carefully adjusted to get the right amount of grease out. And I think the root cause of the problem was that the guy who used to do it and who knew how to do it um, sadly died. 
and those that succeeded him didn't quite have the knack. So we got problems. Um, there was also problems with some um, narrowing of gauge on some parts of the line because of shrinkage of sleepers. There were chairs that weren't quite right, so they were over, over inclined. Anyway, we got into a right mess with it. Uh, and certainly on several occasions, we were down to only being able to run half the fleet of trains. What it did lead to was the train drivers were actually very cooperative and we ran a proportion of trains just between Victoria and King's Cross with a driver at each end and the drivers actually started to compete with the other to see who could get turned round the quickest and do the round trip. Um, and in fact from a customer point of view it meant that places like Victoria and King's Cross frequent intervals had empty trains come in so they actually thought this was much better than than the norm not quite so good if you were at the extremes of the line noise and vibration was always a problem because as I say the line goes under people's property as well as uh, uh, it had an effect it, it, they were quite noisy there were there were noise reduction platforms at the side of the line which knocks about two decibels off I think um, we tried various things. Resilient wheels were tried, which are used quite a lot on tram systems. Um, we had a problem with, so passengers didn't like it. Uh, our neighbours didn't like it. And at some point, legislation changed, so the staff didn't like it because it meant they had to wear earplugs because the noise level, the fact they were in the cab for exposed to the noise for so long, they had to do it. Um, so we had to spend a lot of time uh, treating the railhead better to get rid of uh, corrugations and so on um, <clears throat> and making sure we didn't run trains with flatted wheels, etc. We also changed the um, from bullhead to flat bottom rail over a period of time. We struggled to cope with these increasing passenger numbers. Uh, typically, Victoria Station in the peak would close probably every 10 minutes or so, just hold people back while the platform's cleared. We then, of course, ran in the period where we had to uh, refurbish escalators. And one of the features of the Victoria Line was it was built down to a price. So for most stations, you had one up and one down escalator, that was it. So when you took one of the escalators out for refurbishment, you really found it difficult to cope. So for Victoria, we certainly had quite a big public campaign to persuade people to walk to Pimlico or walk to Green Park rather than use Victoria Station uh, with some success. Um, but it's, it's not a, it was not a pleasant period to go through, I can assure you. The Jubilee Line benefited from that lesson because uh, you know, I think there are more uh, escalators on the Jubilee Line extension than uh, most of the network put together. <coughs> We had some fun times though. We had a thing called the ice cream train. Walls came along, they <coughs> had a new brand of ice cream, Rani Area or something. Uh, and the commercial opportunities people said, oh, this is good, we can make some money here. We can sell advertising on the whole of one train to Walls to advertise this. But they would like to have people walking up and down the train, dressed up in uh, Elizabethan costume with baskets, giving out ice creams to the customers. Anyway, we were up for a challenge and, and we did it. And it was very successful. I think it lasted for about a week. Uh, we had dot matrix indicators by then, so we could actually put up there that, you know, train three was the ice cream train. Um, the train operators liked it because they were well fed with ice cream throughout their shift. And in fact, that particular train, we, we would have been embarrassed because it was the only train with all the advertising for walls in it. Uh, and it did develop faults. But for some reason, the train drivers decided they would ignore the faults and keep the train running. But of course, the people walking up and down the train with the ice cream couldn't carry enough to last all day. So we had to set up a lorry at outside Pimlico Station, another lorry outside uh, Tottenham Hale, refrigerated lorries, 
and they had runners who used to take frozen ice creams down onto the platform to feed the baskets of the people on the trains. So that was very successful, really. Whether it made money, I have no idea. Um, and then we had the Victoria Sidings incident. How, how is it you go for years and nothing like this happens? And then suddenly one day, a driver drives his train in manual into Victoria Sidings and decided not to stop until he hit the sand drag. He managed to trap himself. Um, and it's only when the next train went in the adjacent siding and he could hear shouting that uh, we knew of the incident. So I still believe to this day, if you go into Victoria sidings, halfway down there's a loud klaxon and a flashing light to try and remind you it's time you put the brakes on. Uh, King's Cross fire, of course, sadly uh, killed 33 people, I think. Um, and it had consequences for the whole organisation, but I mean, particularly for the Victoria line, uh, the Federal report demanded various things. Um, Section 12 regulations meant that we had to uh, be very careful about our staff levels, inspecting rooms and so on. We had increased fire brigade call-outs because any sign of smoke, smell of smoke, any sense that there might be a fire, the first thing you did was call out the fire brigade. Um, and they, they were our regular visitors, so they would probably hear more visitors more than most passengers. Um, Eventually, we sorted ourselves out. We got heat-sensitive cameras at uh, key stations. And one of, the, one of the things that was a nightmare was, I always remember the King's Cross platform, where passengers would stand near a ventilation shaft, and at the top end of it, there was a burger van. So the smell always came down, and people always uh, got it. Anyway, we had a birthday party for our 21st anniversary. There's the commemorative tie, if anyone wants to look at it afterwards. We got the go-ahead. Cecil Parkinson was the Minister of Transport at the time. He gave the go-ahead at the party, um, or at Victoria Station actually on the day, uh, of the train refurbishment programme. The prototype was done by Vic Berry, who's a well-known scrap dealer of Leicester. Uh, quite how he got the contract, I know not, but anyway. <laughs> He did the prototype, but the production was done by Babcock in Ross Syth. So, in fact, um, 67 tube stock regularly went over the fourth bridge to, on their way to and from Ross Syth. Train radio was fitted. We had new platform monitors. I'll have to cut through this a bit quicker now. We replaced auto driver boxes with a new uh, thing, distance to go, which, again, we'll talk to you about outside if you want to know more about it. Um, because we had problems getting engineers trains, we actually did use a 67 tube stop train for limited engineering purposes, taking materials to and from site. Uh, we had special covers made for the seats and the flooring, and uh, the P-Way and depot people got into a quite a fine uh, art at getting the uh, stuff moving. Uh, the I IRA campaign affected us at one point where we had to lift the seats of trains every night, which uh, I certainly lost weight, as did most of my colleagues. Um, but we found all sorts of interesting things under the seats when we started. Um, graffiti was a bit of a problem, not so bad on the Victoria Line as many other, because it was much more secure. But uh, we used to outstable trains at Brixton, and there was a vent shaft which... Um, Certain local people got to know how to get into the vent shaft and would clamber down it at night and spray the train at night. So the first you knew about it was when it appeared in all its glory at Brixton Station in the morning. Um, for a period, we had the Guardian Angels who came over from New York to bless us with their presence. Um, and then before licensing came in, we had the buskers. Uh, I, I particularly remember the cat, man in the cat suit at Victoria. Um, if he was good at music, it would have been it would have been a help, but he wasn't. He was just, <laughs> he was just a pain. Anyway, and then we had the PPP years. I, I'd left by then. Um, but um, the good thing about the PPP was actually they had a thing called lost customer hours. 
and you justify the expenditure on how many lost customer hours you could save. Well, because the Victoria Line was so heavily used, it meant it got probably a disproportionate amount of money. So block joints and all sorts of other things were renewed on the Victoria Line where they wouldn't have been otherwise. But just a few pictures. The, the letter up on the screen now is from Robert Dell, the person I mentioned earlier. Um, it, I, we invited him to the 21st birthday celebration, but as the letter said, he was unable to be there. But it does say, I have in my possession a copy of my original report submitted to the board in 1959 for opposing ATO for the Victoria Line, and also a copy of the patent, patent specification. There we go. So, that's the prototype uh, train in the original livery. That's a view of the interior. That's the revised livery. <clears throat> I call it the oarsman livery. There was a young guy in uh, Acton who decided he didn't like the official livery and thought he could do better and he submitted uh, a proposal which I believe was adopted. And that's, that's it. A couple of shots of uh, 67 refurbished 67 cheap stock in service. And then in 95, we put together a, uh, a development plan. Our vision was to be the 92nd railway where every second counts and people matter. That's 40 trains an hour. We had a thing called the space train, um, which I'll show you a picture of in a minute. We were going to have overhead conductors rather than conductor rails. We were going to have a loop at Hearn Hill to get the quick turnaround of trains. We did consider a service up the Lee Valley rather than just running staff trains, but dismissed that because he would have split the service. We even went to think about a Walthamstow loop, so you, we would end up with a Victoria Line circle line. Um, we thought we could go with a new CBTC signalling system, which was becoming more available and cheaper. To get the 40 trains an hour, which the 92nd Railway is, would have meant major station upgrades to be able to clear platforms quickly enough. We wanted full gating, which we got, and we actually proposed to do something like the Channel Tunnel does to give us 24-hour operation every day of the week by restoring the crossovers at Walther, at, um, <coughs> they were there at Walther, so Highbury, Warren Street and Victoria. So you could, <coughs> you could go either way on either route and the maintenance people could have the other bit. There's a picture of the model of the space train. You can have little wheels articulated. Uh, the pitch between the longitudinal seats would have been the same on that as on a D-stop or an S-stop now. Okay, so briefly into the 21st century. Um, now 09 stock. Um, the original upgrade of the Victoria Line was contracted in 2004. Work started in 2006 and was largely completed in 2012. Um, Service control moved from Coburg Street to Osborne House. Osborne House was named because, of course, Queen Victoria's favourite residence was Osborne, is Osborne House. Uh, the power had to be upgraded, the track had to be upgraded. Um, the impact on customers wasn't as bad as some. It, it was uh, week, early closures and some weekends. Uh, the outcome is we now have 36 trains an hour on the Victoria Line. It runs, I I've personally, every time I travel on it, it, it works far better now than it ever has done, I think. Um, certainly the project, I think, can be deemed successful. Certainly there was good, the, the, the line management team and the project team co-located, so problems got resolved very quickly. The staff were heavily involved. And then, of course, Night Tube uh, came on later on, on Friday nights and Saturday nights. That's a picture of a 19, uh, an 09 stock being delivered. That's the computer generated image of an 09 stock. Uh, the principal driving position is on the right hand side, unusually on a 09 stock. And that's because that's where most of the platforms happen to be on the right. That's a picture in the control centre at Osborne House. So quite simple. That's the working timetable with the night tube service in it and 36 trains an hour. That's an 09 at King's Cross. The green lines on the 
platform uh, were an attempt to, a number of different ideas were tried, but that was an attempt to persuade people to keep the green bits clear. So stand in the non-green bits and then you can get on and off trains much more easily. So where to next? Well, I don't know. As there's not a lot of money about at the moment, I probably guess it's not going anywhere further just for the moment. But um, the lines seem to be, to me, to be eminently suited to platform edge doors or barriers. Um, could it be fully automatic? Well, it could be. Uh, increasingly, metros are fully automatic. 40 trains an hour, in my view, is possible, but would require major work on some of the stations. Uh, could you extend the line? You, well, I'm sure you could, but I'm not sure you would want to because it's already f pretty heavily used. And if you went further out, people just wouldn't get on the train coming into London, which wouldn't work. I think you could have 24-hour operation all week if, you, if there was a business case. And, of course, what is the impact of Crossrail 2? Crossrail 2, otherwise known as the Chelsea Hackney line of the past, uh, replicates the Victoria line in part would relieve a lot of it. And if that comes in, who knows when, um, that may help the Victoria line. So, thank you. I've, I've got in. in thank you, John. Thank you, John, very much for that very comprehensive and personal account. I <coughs> suspect it will give rise to either some questions or just some recollections if any of John's professional colleagues want to add their bit about how they made the Victoria Line work, do feel free. But uh, questions, please. We have a microphone. Or we don't. You can have this one if not. Have you, have you switched the bottom switch on? Yeah. Just flash the one. <coughs> Take this one and I'll shout. There's another switch, it does work. Uh, th thanks for a very interesting talk. Two, two quick questions. Are there actually any fixed signals at all, or is it, does the driver therefore see anything in the tunnels at the, in the form of a signal? And secondly, if you've got a train out stationed at Brixton, how is that crewed? Is, is there drivers who sign on and sign off at Brixton rather than at Northumberland Park? Uh, well, now there's a... Uh, the, the crews are almost evenly split between a train crew depot at Seven Sisters and another train crew depot at Brixton. When I was there, there was just a single train crew depot at, uh, at Seven Sisters. And there were a small number of crews who were on all night. <coughs> um, so they, they would be the ones that took the trains from Brixton. Um, <coughs> uh, oh, the other question about fixing. Fixed signal. Uh, a signal. Yes. A lot of the signals were replaced by things called a headway post, but uh, in, in advance of junctions and at the head wall of a station, you always had a conventional signal. So if you were driving manually or it was a, a non-fitted train, you could um, <coughs> you could use those signals. Okay. Thanks. Two, two more at the back there. Uh, there's two at the back and then we'll come to the front. Um, I just wondered, in connection with that uh, refurbishment uh, contract, whether you remember a company called Tickford Rail who were do. doing that work? <coughs> uh, yeah, I mean, the 67 tube started a refurbishment programme that covered actually 67 tube, 72 tube. In fact, they're still running on the Bakerloo um, and, and the sea stock. Uh, and Tickford Rail was certainly involved. I mean, the, I, I can't now remember exactly who did what um, but Tickfords were certainly involved uh, were they based in Leicester? Uh, well Vic Berry were in Leicester but uh, um, Tickford Rail were uh, in the Coventry area oh, Only Coventry, reason that's right yeah, yeah they, they did the design work for it mm. uh, Vic Berry did the um, construction work shall we say and, and, Bab the, the and only subsequently reason Babcock did the uh, rebuilding work. 
the only reason I, I, I mentioned it is that I was involved in ensuring the contract actually with, with, with all these cars being refurbed. And it was really weird seeing the, um, each individual car go up on the M1 uh, because for some reason they couldn't uh, negotiate some sort of deal to get them moved by rail. So oh. you had the ridiculous position where each individual 750 trains made all these journeys to mm. Edinburgh uh, or Rosyth near yeah. Edinburgh. Well, so, some did go by rail in the early oh, days. Oh, did they? Oh, right. Uh, I, I, I suspect it was a combination of money, but more likely it was the getting the paths all the way up there reliably. Yes, I so think that was what the, they said, the, yeah. <clears throat> the train sadly would have spent a lot of time in sidings and would have messed up the production programme. Mm. So that must be the only underground train to be refurbed in a, sh in a shipyard, actually. Yeah, it does remind me, actually, one of the first ones back, when we put it in through the train wash for the first time, it leaked like a sieve. <laughs> and I, I remember speaking to the people at Ross Ice because one of their other jobs was to look after the uh, Royal Navy's nuclear submarine fleet. <laughs> <laughs> and I did sort of say I was a bit disappointed that they couldn't <laughs> seem to... Make our trains uh, watertight, but yeah. excellent. It was all uh, after that; they were fine. <laughs> Good. Oh, thank you very much. Okay, there's Nick, I think, at the back. And then I, I, might, I might refuse to take questions from Nick. <laughs> I was interested in your comment midway through about uh, problems with lubricators. Yeah. The company I work for um, used to hire quite a lot of specialist uh, maintenance plant. Trolley, track trolleys and iron men and when I think it must have been the latest stock was coming in they were experiencing problems with sliding on breaking into stations and the finger was pointed firmly at uh, the maintenance track trolleys and iron men as being you've got mm -hmm. grease on the rails overnight mm -hmm. work <coughs> yeah, and I know so colleagues were regularly called in to uh, explain why situations had occurred Yes, it was a bit of a bit of a black art, really, getting the track lubrication spot on. <clears throat> um, if you followed the drawings and the manuals, it was virtually impossible to get it right. But individuals got to know the techniques. In oh, fact, we, in we we had a small group of very good people who knew exactly what to do. We used to call. In fact, they had their little business cars called Greasers R Us. <laughs> <coughs> uh, and we used to use them quite a lot while we were going through this problem, trying to get the balance back. OK, pass the mic back to Nick, but I'll, I'll ask this member here just to ask the question. Um, um, living in Walthamstow, um, obviously, I think the line is just brilliant, having used it for so long. Um, and I think it's better now than it's ever been, particularly now more trains yeah. go through to Walthamstow. Um, the only negative thing I can think is sort of a regular commuter. You mentioned noise and vibration. The level of background noise when the train's going fast, uh, I don't know where the fastest section is, like between King's Cross and Highbury or somewhere, I guess. But if you're actually sitting next to someone, it is difficult to actually have a conversation with them. <coughs> I mean, is, is the level of background noise louder on the Victoria Line than others? Or is it just the fact of a function of the speed the train's doing? Or um, is there anything, any way around that? Yeah, I don't know necessarily it's louder than everywhere else. I mean, there are some fast sections on the Victoria mm. line. I mean, a lot of the other lines mm. just can't get up those speeds in the tunnel sections. So the noise tends to go up with increasing speed. Mm -hmm. um, I, and you, I mean, I, I got on a Jubilee line train, actually, I have to say, the other week and between... I, don't know, I think it was between Canada Water and Clary Wharf. The noise level was very high because the train, the train was going quite fast there because you're doing nigh on sixty, um, <clears throat> and, it, and there was obviously quite bad rail corrugation, and that really does, it's almost painful. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think I think noise generally is a problem for underground railways. Um, London particularly, it's a tube tunnel and the train is very close to the tunnel wall, so it's reflecting back all the time. I mean, if you could make it, I suspect Crossrail, for example, will be a lot quieter because it's much bigger tunnels, uh, the trains are much bigger, so you can insulate them much better. Um, but yeah, it's a, I think if, 
if people could come up with a simple answer to getting rid of the noise, they would, because it's recognised as a problem. Yeah. yeah. OK, Nick, be gentle, please. Well, they're, they're, I'm pleased to say they're recollections rather than questions Good. from my <laughs> days as an area manager on the Victoria Line. One was, you mentioned the auto drive boxes, and uh, I went to a train in the Overrun Tunnel at Brixton that had gone south without problem but wouldn't go north, so they dropped it back into the Overrun. And uh, went down with the uh, car examiner who promptly uh, got to work and said, I'll need a hand at this point to lift the box, which I thought, well, I don't remember seeing a spare, so I don't know what he's going to do with that. So we lifted this about six inches. And he then said, right, drop it. Well, we dropped it, and there was a bang, and dust flew everywhere. And a, a cry from the ATO at the front saying, yeah, we're OK, everything's come up now, <laughs> which took me back to my television at home. Uh, the second one, there was at least a third um, unintended fully automatic train when uh, I was at uh, Highbury in the office and got a call from the line controller who said, could you meet 217 on the north or whatever it was? And I said, yes, OK, what, what's the issue? And he said, oh, it's left its driver behind. Uh, I was very relieved to say that when I met it, the driver was back on it, or the ATO, and what had happened was uh, equally embarrassing to some of the ones you were talking about, where the door had wedged open on one car um, at Green Park northbound, I think, and he again had got out onto the platform to walk down to, because he saw the door indicator light, and at that precise moment, one of his colleagues appeared opposite the wedged open door, gave it a he healthy kick, the door shut and the train went. <laughs> And uh, the conversation went something like, oh, hello, Fred, I thought you were on early turn today. I am. <laughs> well, where's your train? At Oxford Circus. <laughs> and it then became clear that the door had helpfully kicked and shut and the train had gone and left its ATO behind. But we got away with about five minutes on the item on that one because they were very good and went up behind on the next train and sorted it out. Um, and the... ATO, being a senior man, had never put a foot wrong. We went through his entire record and there wasn't a blemish on it other than this incident. But that was the third uh, one to join the two that you mentioned. <coughs> there may well be more that none of us ever heard of. But <laughs> the most challenging place to get a mic to is right in the middle there. Um, this is by way also of being a recollection. Um, I'm very old, and uh, in the 1960s, I lived in London and travelled from the south to the north at the weekends uh, because I had lodgings in the south and lived in the north. Um, and I spent one whole weekend in Oxford Circus watching them build the umbrella. Absolutely fascinating. I, I've been looking from on the pictures to see if I could see myself, but um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, it really was a fascinating weekend to watch, <coughs> um, yeah. and uh, uh, very impressive, very impressive. Thanks for that. Anybody else? Or are we, yes. Okay. Nice and easy. This one. Hi. Thank you. Uh, where will trains maintained prior to 1986? Uh, well, I mean, day-to-day -day maintenance was at Northumberland Park. Yeah. But every five years or thereabouts, trains would go back to Acton Works. Ah, right. Yeah. For their heavy overhaul. Well, <coughs> uh, and for, well. for reasons not connected with the Victoria Line, uh, a study was done when lots of money was needed to be spent on Acton. And it was decided <laughs> that trains didn't need to go back that often. They, the work could be done at the rolling stock depots, uh, but there was some investment in Acton with a, uh, an equipment overhaul workshop to, to overhaul the traction motors and so on. Um, we're beginning to lose our audience because of the time, I think, not because of the interest, John, I'm sure. So I think we'll, we'll begin to draw it to a close, if we may. Um, my brief recollection, which is in a way a, a sort of second-hand one, of course, you showed that famous photograph of my then boss, Eric Wilkins, uh, sitting next to the Queen on the first train to Victoria. Immediately prior to that, the Queen had arrived from Buckingham Palace by car to Green Park, where she entered the station, as she would have done as a passenger, 
and had been given a sixpence to operate the ticket machine, which was meant to deliver her ticket to get through the ticket gate, the royal sixpence was rejected. <laughs> and Eric Wilkins, my boss, who dined out on this story for years afterwards, said he put his hand in his pocket and he said a little prayer which said, please, Lord, may there be another sixpence in my pocket. And there was, and he produced it, and the Eric Wilkins sixpence was accepted by the machine and the Queen, and the queen proceeded. So, all of that, and thank you for your contributions too, I think shows that whereas the history is fascinating, the best way to have it told is by people who were there and can talk about those things and talk about ice cream trains and all the other things that we heard about. So thanks, John, very much, not only for all he told us and the way he told it, but also, as you discovered, battling a little bit with some hoarseness in his voice uh, and also jet lag, which I don't think did show, but I know um, he was battling that as well. So for all of those reasons, please, our thanks to John. and the other way. Thank you very much. Safe journey home by Victoria Line or whatever. And uh, we'll see you in the two, the two meetings in March. You're welcome.